it out. So uh, I think it's glad to see that a lot of folks were able to make it over your time. Um, we hold our meetings here at these facilities. We want to thank them uh, for providing that and all their help and assistance. Um, generally, we have meetings on Wednesday, but had a little bit of a switch over. Today's Thursday. Uh, information about our organization can be found at uh, www.nylife.org. And you might be interested in joining the mailing list if you want to get more involved. And I love talk is a social and technical uh, conversation. Um, the Nylife Announce mailing list is primarily one way. It tells you about all kinds of things that are happening in this area, open source related. We also have an active IRC community as well. The jobs website might be of interest. People who have job postings, put them up there. There's more than a few today that came across. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. Does anybody have any announcements? Yes, All right. Yeah. Um, in March, I gave a presentation on PC Linux OS. Uh, yeah. Last week, uh, PC Linux OS just surpassed Ubuntu as the number one most downloaded CD image. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. PC Linux OS surpassed PC Linux OS, yeah, just surpassed the most downloaded. Yeah. Very interesting. Cool. Yeah. A lot of that Well, ease of use goes a long way. You should <laughs> You can check out the movies that we have. We've got uh, digitized. Uh, MPEG movies as well on the site in the archives, so you should check that out. Yeah, the audio's um, up. Fact, right? you're, you're, uh, the audio's up. And you have the full audio have, of the entire lecture have, on archive.org. I have some video, I've got most of the video, and the audio, mm -hmm. I think Ron already posted the video. All right. Audio, yes, we yeah. haven't got any of yeah, video. video I have to give you back. Um, I want to also thank some of the other folks from Google who have helped to make this all possible. Number one, uh, Dr. Craig Neville Manning who was a speaker of ours about a year ago or so. Uh, we hope to have him back. Chris Devona, uh, the Director of Open Source Community and Relations uh, based out of the Bay Area, who uh, came by a month or two ago to say hello. Dan Bentley, Darcy Eglin, Susan Zolizzi, and uh, John Holly, who uh, was all, is also going to be here next month. Um, let me thank some of the execs really quick. Ron Guerin in the back, who is a primary force and really helps to keep things going every single month. Peter Norton, Tony Johnson, John McCall, Jack Rupel, and Larry Duchovny, thanks for uh, working the desk downstairs. Uh, one announcement here on the Python workshops. We meet every other Tuesday at the Hudson Library at 66 Leroy Street in West Village, 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Next meeting is on October 9th. So uh, definitely check that out. Uh, the next meeting for NILA is on October 10th, and we will post details on uh, the topic pretty soon. Uh, tonight we've got a very interesting uh, presentation and demonstration. Uh, one of my fellow colleagues, Jason Perlow, has uh, installed the newest version of Ubuntu on his laptop. That's he. Going to take us through uh, probably all kinds of different things. The uh, SUSE operating system that's running on the box, uh, various pieces of uh, what's happening with the Bluetooth and features. So let's please give more and welcome to Jason Perlow from IBM. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How's it going? You have a, a nice crowd here. Um, Jim asked me uh, about a week ago, uh, just as I had joined IBM uh, on literally. Less than oh, about a week ago, uh, I think just finished my orientation um, at our Fairfax uh, uh, Virginia facility. I just came back, and uh, <clears throat> I just came out of Unisys, uh, which is a um, <clears throat> an interesting company, very large systems integrator that is kind of going through some interesting phases right now, trying to uh, become more of a Linux friendly shop, or traditionally a Microsoft shop, and I was brought in there. To help them build their open source business, and that's what I did for two years. And, uh, and uh, IBM came calling about a month and a half ago, and then um, <clears throat> my wife decided to call me that mm, maybe you should consider this job. So I'm now over at IBM. Um, I've been covering Linux for about uh, close to 15 years now. I've been writing for Linux Magazine for nine years. The publication started in 1999, January of 1999, and um, I started writing for them very shortly there afterwards. And um, I'm currently senior technology editor for Linux Magazine, and I write the 
end of my book column, and I also edit the desktop column. I actually wrote the desktop column for about five years, and I just surely handed it over to another gentleman by the name of Ken Hess, and I, I edit the columns, and I uh, collaborate on topic matters and such. Um, one of the most more popular uh, Linux distributions that we cover in the magazine, um, actually the two, one of the two more popular ones that we cover are Ubuntu um, and OpenSUSE. And I guess uh, even though Linux Magazine is a uh, more of a business-centered publication, uh, we still have a lot of people who are developer types or hobbyist types that read the publication. And of course, you know, while we do cover you know RHEL and, and SLES and you know uh, some of the other um, commercial Linux distributions, people really want what they can get for free. Because I mean, if you're a developer, you don't want to be spending five, six hundred dollars, thousand dollars on a commercial Linux distribution when you can get the same equivalent tools out of a community version. Um, back in 2004, um, I wrote a column called um, "Has Eco Lost His Mojo." And uh, that was a column basically stating why has SUSE sort of fallen out of favor with the community and why is it, you know, what's going on with Novell. And um, that got some very interesting feedback from Novell. The first thing that, that happened is I got a call from the CEO of the company. <laughs> he said, Jason, um, you know, that's very interesting what you said. Um, why, why don't you, you know, get on the phone with some of our developers and people and uh, you know, we'll see what we can do. One of the things I proposed in that column was is that Sousa and Rubel retired um, Sousa Linux Professional because it was in direct sort of competition um, with the enterprise versions of the operating system and that um, they were losing developer focus because um, they just didn't have a very good, they didn't have a free version of their stuff. And they didn't have what Fedora was doing. They didn't have what Debian was doing. Um, Ubuntu at the time was just starting to come out. The first version of Ubuntu was released. I think it was called Cori Head. It was Breezy or it was Cori Head. I don't remember. It was like four, version 4 or whatever it was. It was the first version um, in 2004 that had just been released. So uh, OpenSUSE uh, basically came about because I, I'm not, not going to take credit for being the father of the OpenSUSE distribution. But they did tell me, listen, Jason, we listened to you. We had a uh, developer you know, conference internally. We said, you know what, it's a good idea. Let's release SUSE as open source and uh, concentrate the products on the SLEDs and SLED products, and let's give out uh, SUSE for free. And since then, SUSE has been I mean, going fantastic great guns as a community distribution. So what I'm going to show you tonight um, are two different great community distributions. We're going to show you Ubuntu um, Gutsy Given. Um, which is going to be released in the end of October uh, time frame. Um, Open SUSE is also due about the same amount of time. They just, actually, they may even sooner. Um, they just released uh, release Candidate 1 like three days ago. Um, I've got that installed and ready to show you. You can see what all the latest and greatest stuff uh, Open SUSE is. Let's see how this works. So, again, uh, a little bit about me again. I'm senior technology editor for Linux Magazine. I'm writing about Linux. Yeah, I guess it's about maybe 12, 13 years now. I'm also a food writer. Um, used to write for the New Jersey section of the New York Times Food Reviews. I have my own food blog site. That's kind of like a food and technology combination blog of the broiler. Um, born and raised in New York. Um, grew up in the Queens, uh, Great Neck, Little Neck Quarter. Um, live in New Jersey with my wife Rachel. I like have two poodles. You, know, you, you always feel like a big guy with two like dogs. That's me. And um, I work for Ivan Global Technology Services, which is our consulting and services arm. Um, okay, so what's Ubuntu? So the the translation from the, um, I think it's Swahili, is it, um, dialect, is humanity towards other people. Um, it's a user-friendly um, community operating system. Um, it's developed, um, you know, basically, uh, it's based on the Debian technology. You guys use Debian and all the AppGet system for uh, auto resolves uh, system dependencies. So it's, everything comes from a, uh, different repositories that's pulled in from the internet. So you can you basically have a very small distribution, like a, a single, you know, a single CD that gets installed on a, on, a, on a laptop or a computer, 
and the rest of it is pulled from the internet. Now, you don't, the base system is actually pretty basic. Um, they give you a, a base you know, desktop with uh, open office and a browser and the email client and a few other things and some messenger and that's about it. It's very clean. It's not, you know, stuffed up with all kinds of software. I mean, it's basically your job at that point to add all the software for the ones that you want to add to it. Um, the company, the organization is not about making a profit in many respects. It's very similar to Debian. It's the community distribution. They have somewhat different goals, but, but again, they also interoperate with each other. Um, they are sponsored by Canonical, which is a, uh, a company that was founded by a South African billionaire named Mark Shuttleworth. Um, it's kind of interesting that the name is Shuttleworth because he went on like the, uh, the Russian uh, space rocket a couple years ago and went up to the space station. I think he spent like a hundred million dollars on it or something like that. Was it 20? Okay, so it was a bargain, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the Ubuntu philosophy is that everyone should have the freedom to download, you know, run, copy, and distribute, you know, improve the software without paying any kinds of licensing fees. So it's sort of like the ultimate, you know, hippie, you know, you know, share and free love, free <laughs> rock and roll, free sex kind of a thing. Right? It's, um, again, the software should be usable by people also in a lot of language choice. One of the things about Ubuntu is it's developed. Um, a lot of different language um, options. And if you live in Israel, you can install the, the Hebrew version and look, it looks completely native Hebrew. If you might, you're in Spain or in the Latin American countries, you can have completely Spanish, you have Korean version, Japanese version, Chinese version. It's very um, localized towards any of those countries, and that's why it's getting really popular. And, you know, most of people should be given the opportunity to use software even if they work under a disability. Ubuntu has quite a few um, software extensions for people with disabilities, screen readers, you know, large fonts, that kind of stuff, um, which is very nice. So again, it was birthed by the desire to make a difference in the Linux distribution world. Um, they saw a need for an affordable and user-friendly operating system. Um, again, at the time when it was released, the first one came out, um, I think Fedora was in its like second or third version. Maybe in the um, third version. And again, none of these, I mean, all these were great distributions, but they were not particularly super user friendly. You still need to be, you know, a Linux power user, somebody that was somewhat technical to be able to install a Linux distribution, get configured and working on your PC with all the drivers and all that kind of stuff. Um, and since then, it has been, become one of the most popular Linux distributions. Now, if you look at distrowatch.com, um, I don't know, I guess PC and Linux must have surpassed it just now or something, but it is definitely way up there in terms of more popular Linux. It's definitely had a Red Hat um, and some of the other ones that you may know about there. Hmm? It might have been surpassed by PC Yeah, last, last week. Last week. Yeah? Okay. We're already at a date for presentation. <laughs> Check your back. Sink floor. Uh, PC Linux OS. I think that, I think that actually is PC Linux OS. Is that mean based or is it? No, it's based on Mandriva. It's Mandriva based. It's Mandriva based. Interesting. Um, so what is what is Ubuntu come with by default? Um, Akiga is a um, is a SIP uh, soft IP phone client. Um, it's pretty neat if you have like one of those IP uh, bridge type uh, devices in your house. You can actually use that to make telephone calls for your computer. Um, Evolution Email, which is the email client that was originally designed by the guys over at Zimian, and then they got put out by Novell, so now they are developing a you know, greater GNOME project. Um, it looks kind of like Outlook. If you ever use Microsoft Outlook, it's got all that great stuff in it. It's got scheduling, it's got, it's, it's got a nice, really good user interface if you still use traditional mail clients. I use Gmail. Um, but you can actually set up Evolution to use the top um, Google's Gmail stuff, and it works really well. It's got a lot of games. Um, I don't have much time for games these days, but my wife likes to play those card stuff. You know, that's usually what the main application is on the computers. But when I got when I took her Windows away a couple weeks ago, that I just got completely set up. She was complaining that uh, Windows Vista was like asking too many questions, and it was you know being a pain in the ass. It was really slow. She's like, can you fix this thing? I said, I'll fix it. 
So if my wife is not running, I'm going to on her laptop. And uh, I actually gave her, I, we still use a couple Windows applications, this, this legacy stuff that we use, like um, we use, um, actually Google Picasa is actually a popular application that has to take a lot of digital photos. Although well, there is a native build for a Picasa for Linux, I use it. It's not quite big yet. Still does crash quite a bit. I find that the Windows versions a bit more stable. I also use some home accounting stuff on Windows. One of the cool things about Ubuntu is that the, uh, the VMware um, player client is actually built into their uh, distribution piece. You can just install with app get install VMware player. Don't have to recompile the kernel. Don't have to make any modules. Bang, it just works. And you can, and if you've got a, uh, a virtual machine, you can just copy right into the directory and bang, fire it up. You got Windows in the window. And you can still use, you know, your Windows applications, and Windows doesn't even know it's running in its own little box, um, which is where I like it. Windows. Um, got spell checking built into the system for all the major applications. Lots of multimedia stuff. Um, the new version of Gutsy Given actually that's coming out. Actually, I think they, they started doing it with Feisty, which is the, which is the current version that's, that's production, uh, is that the, the media players for GNOME um, it told them actually now automatically downloads codecs. So if you don't actually have, for example, the Windows Media Player codec or the, uh, the QuickTime codec, it actually goes out to the internet and grabs it for you so you can play whatever file you need to play. So it actually happens to like, figure out which codecs you're missing and manually install them, which is that's okay in the button. And it has a lot of other applications available. Um, there's a huge repository um, out there for going to. They've got all the Debian stuff is backported. So if you get like a favorite Debian application, don't add the Debian repository because you'll break your distribution. But they have something called Universe and Multiverse that you can add. And I'll show you, you know, how the Debian repositories work if you're not familiar with them, um, and how you can install all your favorite stuff. Um, what can it do? Well, here's you know a laundry list of stuff, all the stuff it can do: internet, email, games, presentations, you know, graphics, web design, word processing, digital photography. I mean, this just if you can't find the software that you need off of the Ubuntu, you know, just, you know, uh, feeds, you're doing something wrong. Because it's just, I mean, unless you've got some really special, special industry-specific application that you need to run, there's just tons of open source software out there. Um, again, what can it do? Well, you can't natively run applications that can developed in Microsoft. Duh. Um, there's some, you know, oddball hardware out of the box, like if you've got, like, you know, you're trying to install it on a 486, you know, and you've got, like, some ISA hardware from, like, 1994, you know, you might, or some strange proprietary dongle thing that you bought from, like, a, you know, a Taiwanese or Korean computer store in Flushing, you know, or something. <laughs> you might have a problem, but it's fairly industry standard, you shouldn't. Um, there is proprietary driver support from something called, what is now called, it was actually, this was actually instituted with Spicy, the last, the last version, called Restricted Drivers Manager. I will show that to you. Um, it's not going to quite work that right in the administration because we're running all this under VMware. Um, but basically, let's say you've got, you know, uh, let's say the ATI drivers, right? You know, a lot of these notebooks come with the ATI rating on uh, mobility chip built in. Well, you don't have to go out to the ATI website and Download the driver pack, run the installer, you know, make sure you've got the developing tools installed so it doesn't recompile and you don't need to do that. You just go to the restricted drivers manager, uh, you do install, ATI, bang, it downloads it from the repository, it installs the, the video driver, and you've got accelerated ATI support. We also have sending for NVIDIA and a whole bunch of other cards out there that have closed sourced Linux drivers. So that's very nice. Um, I think that's bad about it. It's community distro, so there's nobody for you to sue if it breaks. So for those of you working in uh, enterprise companies that want to use Ubuntu, yes, there's an Ubuntu server. It's a good product. But, you know, if your CIO says, well, something goes wrong, who the hell do we call it breaks? That's, that's a consideration. Now, I understand that Canonical is just looking at doing some type of enterprise um, consulting uh, services type of, of deal. I haven't been really forthcoming on it. Usually they, they outsource that to partners and such in different countries. So they're like usually small consulting shops that will come in and do a bunch of work for you, which is great. I mean, all these guys are very, very knowledgeable, but 
Um, this is definitely, you know, if you're on a budget, you want to do a startup, I think this is a great idea to implement it into the server. But um, if you're, you know, a, a Fortune 500 company, and maybe, maybe not, depending, you know, what the application is for a developer environment, I definitely think it's an excellent distribution. Um, what are the advantages of Ubuntu? Um, very large community developers and end users. Not only do you have all the Ubuntu developers, but you also have all of the Debian developers, right? Because they're sort of like, you know, brother and sister distributions, uh, like a dysfunctional family. They kind of like, you know, they still yell at each other, at, you know, during that Thanksgiving, you know, they, they hear people scream and yell at each other. The young uncle still like gets too drunk and, you know, gets everybody upset. But the, the key is, is that there's a very large community between Ubuntu and Debian. And the Debian guys are doing sort of like, you know, low level hardcore kernel work. And then what happens is the Ubuntu guys say, all right, we're going to mirror your development tree and then we'll make our tweaks to it so we can make it human usable. And a lot of these Debian guys, they're like, they don't shower, they don't, you know, have very good social skills, you know, but they're smart. But they just don't know how to make a distribution for like normal human beings. And it also takes them like three years to release a new distribution. Um, I was actually, there was like a huge, huge like uh, a round of applause like when the last uh, Debian was released, the new Debian, uh, what was that? I forgot the name of it was. Etch. Etch, yes, because it was SARS and it was Etch, and there was like three and something odd years between the release of them. Um, one thing about uh, Ubuntu is that it actually is developed on a six month cycle. So, by the time you're like you're ready to, you just got used to your current one. Well, the new one's out. Um, now, one of the things they do do is they have uh, what they call an LTS, long-term support. So there's they basically flag a certain release level. Uh, in this case, think of it as um, 606, uh, which is designated as the LTS support version, um, and that's 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 Dapper, which is the pre it's like two build before the, the current one that's under development. And that one is actually supported for a much longer, um, it, it stays stable for, you know, it's equivalent to that being stable, I guess, that sort of tracks that same methodology. Um, but, I mean, this is sort of a really, you know, it's definitely a, a bleeding edge type of a deal. I mean, you've got your Ubuntu uh, guts you get them going, and then six months later they come out with, I don't know, um, hippie hamster or something, you know. Um, you know, you're going to want to look at probably upgrading. You can actually do a distribution upgrade live right on the system. You do the app get disk upgrade. Um, there have been problems with that in the past. People have had, especially when they just release the distribution and it has bugs and stuff in it. Sometimes, like you'll, like, you'll come back and your X will stop working and <laughs> not good. So I actually, I actually advocate doing full clean installs of Ubuntu. Um, or really any Linux, di Linux distribution. Um, if, you're, you know, if you like to test stuff like I do, I mean, I'm, I'm testing different Linux distributions all the time. I usually put, um, you know, I have a box that I run Red Hat or I run Debian and I leave it alone. I use it as my server and I just dump all my stuff to it. I leave my home directory there, my internet that share it, do whatever I need to do. And whenever it comes time to redo my workstation, I don't lose all my stuff. I just blow away the workstation. I just Reinforce my data on my, my network connection or something. Um, so again, it's easy to get. Um, it's 100% free. Literally, it does not cost anything. Um, very easy to install additional software, which is what I'm actually going to demonstrate that for you. Again, available in lots of different languages. You can share it with anybody. And again, every six months they come out with a new one. So it's always like that, that sort of Christmas present you get every six months. And it's a new one. Okay, now besides Ubuntu, which is the general GNOME flavor, there's three other flavors out there. Um, Edge Ubuntu was a product that was started specifically for classroom use, so it's got like other educational software loaded on top of it. Um, I think they've got stuff there that would prevent like porn sites from loading on it and stuff. There's, some, there's more security level um, utilities on it that you can have. Um, and I think it has some kiosk functions, not, actually not kiosk, terminal functions, so you can use like a dumb terminal um, to connect, like, in client to a service. You can have like one PC acting as a main sort of, uh, as, a, as a terminal server, and you have like, you can use cheap 46s or, you know, old PCs to, to go into it with full GUI desktops. Um, 
There's actually a cool side project by a company in England called Nidia. And it's been in development for about, I guess, about three years now. And what they did was they came up with a chip that they can put inside a monitor. And basically, it gives you a keyboard and a mouse uh, connection and an Ethernet connection. And they're, st they're trying to get it down to less than 50 bucks a chip. So basically, you can make any every monitor they want to make, you know, basically any, any monitor manufacturer that makes LCD monitors can add this all point for 50 bucks or less to the cost of the monitor. And you've got a big client workstation that you can sh that you can you know terminal into any of your, your Linux boxes. Um, they actually did a, a case study where they had a um, they went to one of these third world countries in Bangladesh actually, and they installed a, um, a Ubuntu server. It's basically we're just talking a piece a piece inside a PC. I don't even think it had more than five hundred megabytes of RAM in it. Like you know one of these forty gig hard drives. One of these really cheap you know Taiwanese made machines that had. They probably bought for five hundred dollars or less. Um, put it in one of these. Um, I guess you know because those foreign countries they have. When you want to make a, a phone call, they have like these booths, like these. these booths. I, guess it's not, I guess they're like internet cafes um, that uh, you can rent a cell phone or you can rent a, you can borrow a cell phone or get a SIM card to call somebody. <coughs> well, they actually were, were providing internet service at this cafe. So what they did was they took. A whole bunch of these medios, which are just basically LCD monitors, this little tiny box the size of a, a cigarette uh, cigarette case, and uh, they ran the internet off of a single um, GSM uh, internet wireless connection over Bluetooth, and they were able to get like six workstations doing you know web browsing and, and, and email out in the middle of like you know like nowhere. I mean Bangladesh is like the most seriously backward countries and they were able to get them and a whole village of people were able to get internet access. So it was, there's actually a really cool video if you go to ndiyo.com. It's got some really cool stuff if you want to go look at that, what they did with Ubuntu. Now Ubuntu is the KDE version of Ubuntu. And um, I've actually got it installed uh, on the lap here, laptop here in addition to the X Ubuntu. And um, basically if you're a KDE fanatic you basically get a, sub, a, a subset or rather a superset of the standard Ubuntu. Instead of GNOME, they give you KDE Desktop and it has their own tool sets for doing updates and systems management. And it's not a second class citizen. In fact, um, Mark Shelworth himself uses it, as, uses it as his primary desktop. So it's, it's a, a separate but equal development tree to Ubuntu. Um, the latest version that just Ubuntu, and one I particularly like a lot is X Ubuntu, which is the XFCE window manager. And then actually, I think XFCE looks a lot like Windows. Um, and another cool thing about it, it doesn't use up a lot of memory. So like, if you're one of these, you know, hardcore developer types that doesn't want to chew up, that you know needs every single mega of, of RAM that you could possibly need for your compiler or developer work, um, you install Ubuntu, and um, it's got everything you need. It's got all the major, you know, applications, Firefox, and it's got a file browser, and it's got everything you need. Um, it just is a much lighter um, desktop. And it actually comes in um, multiple flavors. Actually, all of the, the versions of Ubuntu come in multiple architecture flavors you can get. An x86 version, you can get an x86-64 version, and a PowerPC version. I actually um, had a friend, um, a sister lives down in Montana, New Jersey, and uh, she wanted to get a new PC for her uh, for her daughter because uh, she was going to school. But um, she had an old iMac that was just you know it ran System 9. It was crashing. It was it was not doing well. Um, you know, and it's way out of, of Apple's um, current technical support line. So I I looked it up and the wow you know they've got a version of PowerPC uh, Ubuntu that will run on a, an iMac, an old Bondi blue iMac with like 256 minutes of RAM. And uh, I said, ah, you know, it's probably not going to work. But so we, so we sat down, popped the CD in. I had to do one firmware update that was from the, Mac, from the Apple site. It took a whole 20 minutes to install it. Booted right up, Firefox, email program, everything. And it was a 400 megahertz uh, iMac with 256 megahertz of RAM. I think it was like a whole 40 meg hard drive on it, uh, 40, 40 gig hard drive on it. And uh, it, would, it ran great, you know. And uh, she didn't need to go out and buy a new computer, and she loves it. You can go to her Barbie site with uh, with the browser and all that. The only, the only problem was that it didn't have 
Uh, in the Flash report, this uh, American Media has only ported the Flash uh, plugin to x86. Um, but other than that, it was it worked great. You've got a couple of old my iMacs, you've got some old PCs that you want to recycle, you know, bring into your you know synagogue or church, you want to give some get some free PCs, or you know, you just want to bring some new light to an old laptop or PC. It's great distribution to use. So what's sort of coming up for a bit? Well, unattended installation. Um, that's sort of a an enterprise thing that if you're familiar with uh, kickstarting. Um, you know, PXC boot processes we're using from uh, Red Hat where you can do deploy a whole lot of workstations, you know, just by, by deploying it over the network that's coming. Um, there's a new and improved server edition coming out uh, with the new Betsy Given release. Um, better window management. Um, we're going to, of course, to continue to provide the very best in free and open source applications. And they do want to release a, a completely quote unquote free compliant, free as in free to not as in beer. Um, there, there are, there's currently, Ubuntu does have um, some pieces in it that are, are non, quote unquote, non free software in, in the religious sense of the word. So they're currently working on you know, components that can be installed, that can be included, that won't violate GPL or any of the other you know, open source licenses. How do you get it? Um, well, you can actually go out and buy a Dell. Um, Dell's got um, a whole bunch of um, low-cost PCs you can buy um, that has Ubuntu preloaded. I think they're a whole couple hundred bucks. And um, you can also uh, get them, they can, they'll mail you a free CD or you can just download the ISO image. It's a whole you know, single CD. It's not like you know, it's several CDs worth of stuff to deal with. Um, you can go to their website and download it. Okay, now OpenSUSE. Um, so I, I'm actually kind of a, a, of a SUSE visit. They get, I've been using um, SUSE for a very long time. Um, I like German engineer stuff. They just, they just know what they're doing. Um, they tend to over-engineer stuff, make it sometimes a little more complicated than the average user needs, but it's always rock solid. Um, so OpenSUSE is a community developed Linux distribution based on SLED, SUSE Linux Professional. Okay, and Susan Lynch Professional basically died out um, as of version 9.3. Um, the first version, uh, 10.0, was released uh, as an alpha beta release in 2004. Um, unlike Fedora, it is both a bleeding edge developer platform and an actual end user Linux distribution. Um, meaning that you know this is something that you know normal power users would use as opposed to is the people that are going to look at the technology and play with the technology. Um, it is a test bed for technology that may be used in SLEDs and SLED. Um, sometimes you see their team releases, uh, you know, they'll add and delete stuff depending on, you know, what Nobel feels like it's going to add into its own main, uh, you know, enterprise path. Um, they did some very interesting things with RC1, which is going to um, end up very on the show you shortly. Um, it's got an open development model for releases on, on three different major architectures. Um, actually, I think they've also got technically a Z series um, version for IBM, but I think they, they may only be doing that's like an unsupported, like experimental version. They, you have the real Z series version is actually on the SLES, their enterprise product. Um, but one thing that the SUSE does have that's different from everybody else um, is they have a build system that is basically they can generate. Um, all different flavors of their distribution and a single release um, just by you know, doing a leak, you know, on their on their source tree. Um, whereas Red Hat and the others sort of have to have sort of somewhat parallel um, development paths, uh, parallel development trees for all their versions. So they're not always completely in sync with each other. Um, SUSE is basically, yeah, well, we, we, we build the application, we build the kernel, and now we've got three different important flavors to spit out at once. So they, have, they were very, very good um, maintenance and release tree, and they're able to turn around lots and lots of software pretty darn fast. I'm going to show you what I mean by, by lots and lots of software. Um, the objective of OpenSUSE is to make it sort of the easiest distribution for anyone to obtain, and the most widely used open source platform. Of course, that's a an objective. Um, SUSE is probably OpenSUSE is probably like number three or number four in terms of popularity. 
Um, that's still pretty high, I mean, considering how many limited distributions there are you know, out of the wild right now. Um, they, they obviously, you know, had a, had a corporate sponsor, so to speak. So their objectives are, are different from a community perspective than what Ubuntu wants to do. Um, probably more similar to what Red Hat wants to do, although they're talking about actually doing an open SUSE, um, not a, what do you call it, a, a 501c3 um, non-for-profit uh, organization for to take control of open SUSE so that then it will not die as open SUSE will still continue. Um, you know, Red Hat actually promised to do a, a Fedora Foundation back when they actually went in the very first release of Fedora, but they never uh, followed on that promise. Um, so it's still, so it's still at this point, sort of like you know, Fedora, sort of like a Red Hat, sort of uh, you know, advertising <laughs> in a lot of ways. Well, they've moved the build system out of the oven. They've opened up a lot of stuff for Yeah. And they use the control. They're getting better. Yeah. I, I think I think the general feeling is that these large companies that, that, that have these big distributions now realize they have a community responsibility um, to sort of keep their noses clean and to keep people interested. Because um, at the end of the day, all the developers and the, and the people who are really testing and banging up their applications are coming from the, the hobbyists and development, you know, in the, in the open source community, not necessarily the suits, you know, in Fortune 500 companies. Although the Fortune 500 companies pay their bills, um, it's the, the, the actual ICAP is coming from the end users and the development community. So they, they have to keep both sets of people happy. Um, so what does it come with? Lots of stuff, really. Um, it's distributed on a DVD. Um, it's a 3.6 gigabyte download. It is a big distribution. Yeah, it, it is, it is, if there's anything bigger, um, I don't know what it is. Um, thousands of software packages are distributed on that DVD. And there's actually more software that it can pull down from the internet. Um, it comes with both the latest version of GNOME and KDE and the the KD4 um, tree, if you want to play with that. Um, it's kind of, that's the early bleeding edge that will blow up in your face, um, but it looks really cool. Um, comes with OpenOffice 2.3, which is the latest and greatest. Um, all versions of SUSE since like, you know, day one have had the, uh, the YAS um, control panel, which stands for, I think it's yet another s setup tool, starting another, yet another software tool. Um, and it is a very comprehensive control plan. Now, if you compare OpenSUSE to Red Hat, I mean, it's like night and day in terms of, of end user, you know, configuration and management tool. Red Hat is like, is very bare bones, it, and it seems like a lot of their, their UIs are sort of like were developed by separate teams of monkeys that didn't really know what the other one was doing. Whereas, you know, SUSE was developed by like a whole bunch of the German guys in Nuremberg who has to do things precisely a certain way. You know, so they're very, you know, very, very technically adept at what they're doing. Um, it's got three desktop effects built into the system with comp is. Um, it's got, you basically just go to desktop effects in, in, the, in the, the YAS control panel and say, you want to turn it on? Yes. There's a recycle of, of, the, of the X window and bang, you've got, you know, all sorts of cool effects going on. Um, SUSE was one of the first distributions to enable Zen um, virtualization, kernel-based uh, virtualization um, in, in the base distribution, um, which is really, really cool stuff, especially if you want to, you know, run Windows uh, virtualized or any other operating system virtualized. And it's, it's actually a hypervisor based virtualization. Um, which is cool for like enterprise type stuff. The management of Zen isn't, isn't quite as good as VMware yet. Yeah, I'm a bit of a VMware bigot because I've been using it for a long time. So I use what I like to use, and it's got a good GUI, and it's got all sorts of you know, virtual machine profile tools that's used to move stuff around. But Zen is definitely catching up. I mean, in terms of performance, really, really, really solid. And uh, you know, once they start getting the management tools at sync with VMware, I think VMware's going to get a serious run for their money. Um, but that's probably going to be coming. And I think you, you'll start to see that different hypervisors are competing with each other. 
pretty seriously within the next six months to a year, you're going to start seeing some very serious competition coming from that. And also from a new hypervisor called KVM, um, which is the, the hypervisor that's actually built into the Linux kernel as of the 2006 that 20 or 21, I'm not sure. Um, App Armor is a file system and application security subsystem that uh, SUSE use, specifically uses. Um, this is in contrast to SE Linux, which is used in Red Hat. Um, Red Hat uses, is able, what it does is it's able to determine whether or not, you know, someone has tried to alter the, uh, the file system paths of any particular file they use in a different directory if they've altered it. Um, it's able to prevent that from happening and alert, you know, a root user and notify that something's going on. Um, it's actually easier to use, in my opinion, than SD of Linux. SD Linux is really pain in the ass to use. Most people, when they install Linux, uh, Red Hat, you know, when they see doing the install fix, it says, enable SD Linux, people go, disabled. <laughs> which is a huge selling point of Red Hat, but people just don't like it. It's, it's, it's evil. Um, Slightly improved. Uh, yeah, it's better, but not, not great. Um, what are the pros of, of, of SUSE? Very large community developers and, and users, again, um, I wouldn't say they're as big as, as Debian or, or maybe not even as big as Ubuntu, but they're pretty darn big in, 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 in the large scheme of things. Um, lots of people in Europe um, are using SUSE. Um, very, very, very good documentation. Again, it's 100% free distribution. Um, very easy to install additional software. They've got a really good software management utility that I'm going to show you. Um, also, a lot of multilingual support like Ubuntu. Big software depositories, both in terms of what they manage internally and what the third-party repositories offer uh, for them. There's a big third-party repository in Germany called Pac-Man, uh, which has like all the latest even, even more bleeding edge for these stuff than what is normally released within SUSE. Um, always has the latest and greatest stuff, and whenever, you, whenever, you, whenever SUSE release comes out, it's always the most current of uh, all the Linux distributions out there by, by a significant margin. Um, it's engineered by Germans, so you know it's going to be stable, it's going to work properly, but you know, like everything else that the Germans make, it's very over engineered, and sometimes it can, get, it can take up a lot of system resources. Um, the cons, big, big, big release. It's a 3.6 gigabyte download. You can get a CD release for a net base install, but it is slow to install since that way, because it has to flow into the internet. Generally, it's got heavier hardware requirements than Ubuntu and most of the Linux distribution, so if you've got a, a machine that's getting on in a few years, you might want to consider not using SUSE. Um, the installer is definitely very easy to use, and I, I find it's, it's an even better installer than, than Windows, um, but it is slow. Um, it does use an external repository um, to pull in external uh, patches of the OS from, from, from the internet uh, when installing. Um, you can turn it off, but then you're just going to end up having to do it anyway once you remove the OS via login. Um, they use a, a, a desktop search engine called Peagle, um, which <coughs> uses up a lot of system resources. Um, you can turn it off. That's usually the first thing that I do when, it, when, it, when I install SUSE. Um, it does work really well once you it's done the, the actual initial indexing, but that can take several hours depending on how much data it's got in the box. Um, there is no commercial, again, like Ubuntu, there's no commercial support. Even though it's sponsored by Novell, you can't go and say, uh, OpenSUSE screwed up my, my $80,000 enterprise server and screwed up my SQL database. No. You can't do that. You can't, you can't sue them. You can't yell them. You got to go into their support forums and deal with you know the community um, issues. So that's the price you pay for you know, a free lunch distribution. Um, how do you get it? Uh, you can download the release candidate. The new RC1 just came out like three or four days ago. Go to suzu.org. You can do it as a direct download, or I recommend you do it by BitTorrent. You let it go for a couple hours. Go out and get a slice of pizza or something for Chinese food, and come back and be ready to burn. It. Okay, so that's the, the sort of the, the presentation part. Um, I'm going to show you now the actual demo. So what you're looking at here, this is the Betsy Given desktop. This is the default, default um, Ubuntu. 
And I haven't changed any of the, the icons or moving anything around. This is what you get right after installing. Um, as you can see, it's very clean. Um, you've got um, here um, a little network manager applet. Uh, if you had a, a wireless network card, um, you would allow you to choose between the various wireless interfaces you have available to you. Um, you've got um, you know, your calendar here, you can change your dates and stuff. This is, uh, you can switch users if you have multiple users on the system. Um, this is a cute little help applet here. And uh, you can actually go through the help system and search them all kinds of topics and stuff. Um, it's all HTML help browser based and you can do all sorts of you know, teach you how to, if you're a complete neophyte, you know, you can give this to your father who wants something. It's got a great, it's got lots of great help in here. Um, you got the uh, Evolution mail system, um, which I think is a really good mail program. And um, I've got, um, you know, I've got this currently set um, to, uh, to get my Gmail. You can see it looks a lot like Outlook. I've got my, all my email messages here. You can see this is a big one I can show you that has some sort of uh, some graphical content or something. Actually, the lots of graphics here because it probably is doing that as I go through the security. Locking that out. Control what? There you go. Somebody read the manual. Dancing with the stars. I hate that show. My wife is like basically. Completely controlled my TiVo. We actually now have two DVRs on them. Like this guy, one of those high def TVs, one of those, you know, we use direct TV. And like, somehow I managed to have like 800 gigabytes of storage for all the things used, and all of them are my wife's reality show programs. And you know, I just want to watch my like History Channel or like, you know, my occasional show I want to watch on HBO or something, or you know, Stargate Atlanta or something, but like, no, you just don't have enough space to record your stuff, Jason. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we end up playing like, you know, TiVo Awards and she's like, oh yeah, I need to delete her. Like, yeah. That's, that's marital bliss here. Um, you've got a contact manager in here. You've got uh, your calendars. All sorts of cute memos. Let's see what we've got. going on in 27 minutes. Uh, oh yeah. All right, so let's look at the other stuff that we've got here. Um, systems management, you can see your preferences here. You've got all your cool control panel stuff in here. Control, you can, you know, be in scene to your desktop. You've got your, uh, your screen savers. Um, we are running in VMware, so if we, if we do try to run some of these screen savers, we'll probably, actually, no, it's not running at that. Lots and lots of screen savers. I'm sure if you like screen savers, there's lots of them here. You can just just turn on the random screensaver stuff and you'll just have all sorts of cool stuff. So no, no excuses for burning out your monitors here. Um, Palm OS syncing. Um, it's interesting. It's harbor information here. It shows you what's currently installed on the system. This is actually, again, I'm running on a virtual machine. So everything is virtual, virtual described here. So it's not like reality. Um, but, um, you can see we've got like a virtual SCSI here. And you, can, you can browse and see what's installed here. Um, and what the kernel's attacks on this control. Um, you got to show you the restricted drivers manager. Uh, driver, there's one that Yeah, we don't need any restricted drivers for a virtual machine. Uh, uh, anyways, if you if you did need restriction drivers, it would pop up and say, oh, you can download the API driver, or we can download the NVIDIA driver, it'll, it'll do all that cool stuff for you. But I can assure you it does work. 
Um, you can change your, uh, your, your graphics and screen resolution here. Got a nice utility for that. Hopefully it doesn't crash on it. We are running, this is definitely getting like nightly built. So I've been running updates constantly just to make sure that everything is up to date, current, what it is today. Like literally on the fly, build stuff like from yesterday. So. These are places so you can go to your, your home folder, your documents. <laughs> Use the Nautilus file browser. Um, I've got a lot of extra stuff that I've installed here because I've got multiple environments running. Um, so all the other stuff there. This is it has all these cool um, multimedia applications. Uh, and Maroc is a, actually it's a KDE application. Let me show you some of the other environments that uh, actually, let me see if we can do the software installer. Here's the app removed. Um, it's sort of like the trademark uh, program of using it. <laughs> to show you how much extra stuff you can get. So um, if you're running a real machine, I could install a VMware player. You don't want to install a VMware player on top of a virtual machine, otherwise bad things happen. Um, excuse me? What's the number? Yeah, Nero is definitely there. Let me take a look. that Miro needs, let's say there's like 16, 20 dependencies that it needs in terms of codex or you know whatever it needs, the libraries that it needs to use, it's going to resolve it all. There's no DLL here, you know, there's no, I need this RPM because I forgot this one, I got to get this one in this location. No, it just does, it just works. Hopefully it will just work because we are running alpha release stuff here. But let's see what Jesus. 
Stalin. So it's got all the different, it's got everything you need. It's got its own special file browser. It doesn't use Nodos. It uses this new thing called um, the Thunar, I think it's called. Yeah. It looks, it works kind of like Nodos. It just uses up a lot of memory. This is, this is XFCE. Yeah. Desktop. Again, it's fairly bare bones, stripped down of a nature, you know, too many. They don't like to put a lot of icons up on desktop. They want that space there for you to utilize. This is their, uh, their network manager application. It's native to KDE. Got their own special browser. Opera. That's Koki. That's Instant Messenger. Amarok, which is a, a really good uh, audio player. It actually will interface with an iPod. This is their, their, their web browser. And a file browser, yeah. Although they did actually install a separate file browser. Uh, new thing. Cell session management. So, yeah, they've got a couple things here. Uh, you got PPPOE configure. And I don't know where you would find it, but uh, yeah, it's in it. <coughs> so, we had a PPPOE. happen um, is during the install you have, you have some options, you have some networks and stuff that you can change. Anybody want to see anything else in uh, the winter? I have a question. 
Um, well, first, the package format is the same. They both use time depth. So if somebody actually releases a package independently of the trees in dot depth format, it will install. Fine. Um, the difference between the trees is, is that um, it's, it's more on, on, on the, uh, uh, like the revision control system that they're using. So it may be actually the same release level for some of these packages. They're just maintaining them separately. Um, in you know either they're changing the descriptive files for for, the, for their package management system, or you know it, it can be a whole bunch of things. I mean uh, each each you know project and package is maintained separately by a, by different people. I mean one developer could be responsible for you know ten packages on uh, the Debian tree and five or six of the equivalent packages on the Ubuntu tree. Um, depends. Um, Ubuntu does use a different kernel. Usually a newer version of the Linux kernel than Debian does. Um, they do tend to do newer releases much faster. So what you'll see in Ubuntu, uh, you'll see in their their release tree will, will be usually what's in Debian's unstable tree. Um, it's just a question of what you know uh, uh, regression testing to do on, on the package. It's a question of, of human effort, you know, labor more than anything else. Yeah, the, the only thing that you're, you're changing is your, I'll show you, the only thing that you're changing is your window manager. The libraries are all there? They're all there. Yeah. In fact, you can install, for example, what I just did right here was, I installed KDE and I installed, you know, um, but I, uh, I just shut the system down. Yeah, yeah. It works. Trust me, it works. <laughs> This is VMware Server 1.04, which is actually a free download for VMware. If you just go to the VMware website, um, you register for a free serial number, and um, you can you download the RPMs or the tarball version, you just run the installer. Um, what you will need, depending on what distribution you're using, um, you will need the kernel headers and you will need the kernel source. Well, you may not need the kernel source, but um, you definitely need the kernel headers and you need the base level development packages for GCC. So what it has to do is it has to compile a uh, couple of different modules that you need for the VMware to run. There's VM, uh, VMMon, which is a virtual machine monitor. There's VMXNet, which is the networking. And also it has to compile a special X uh, driver um, to allow some of this stuff to work. Um, and then once you've installed the operating system in the virtual machine, then there's the VMO tools. Um, and I'll show this to you. First, power on who can see this. So um, I actually wrote an article on how to install this stuff in Linux management about five or six months ago. So if you go to linux-mag.com, you do a uh, search in the VMware server, it's got the whole list of stuff, dependencies you need to do and install. It's not, it's not that painful, it's just, uh, if you use regular Red Hat and stuff, it's already set to go because they've already pre built the modules. If you use like Debian or Fedora or OpenSUSE, it has to actually do the compilation of those modules to get the work. Um, actually, if you use um, Ubuntu, um, you can actually install VMware server just with, with, with the um, with the software installer tool, but you have to add a separate repository to that um, to do that. But it will do it without any pain to do. Install VMware server, click, bang, it works.
uh, open to the, I've only installed in home environment. There is also a KD environment that you can select the installation plan. Stay afloat. Yeah. Well, um, let's take a look at, um, for example, Zimian. Um, uh, actually, no, it precedes Zimian. Uh, there was a company that actually um, was started by the guys who came originally out of Apple that created Macintosh. Um, Benny Hertzfeld was one of them. Um, he's a famous guy in the, in the Macintosh circles. Um, there was a company um, who wanted to produce a, uh, a whole GUI environment. Uh, for Linux that was Macintosh, you know, Macintosh similar. Um, they lasted about a year and a half. They went under, um, and all their intellectual property was reused, um, and is what you see in the GNOME today. Um, the Nautilus browser actually came out of that effort. Um, lots of venture capital stuff was invested in that. You know, up and went down the tubes. The professor stuff that was GPL, um, it got reused. Um, you've also got um, projects from companies like, I don't know if you guys ever remember Loki Games. Um, they were a company back in the late 1990s, it was 1998 or 9 when they, when they were founded, and they did a lot of Linux uh, game ports from Windows. Um, and uh, they ported like 10, 15 games, and um, also uh, like a, a, win in, a new installer package system that looked like the Windows uh, install shield for Linux that they built. And uh, the company uh, completely screwed up. I mean, they, they overcommitted funds and stuff and all sorts of dirty accounting, whatever. Um, I think the, the founder of the, of the company is like in Mexico someplace. <laughs> um, but a lot of their international capital was reused um, for other game development and other stuff. Like their installer, the low key installer, is actually used by a lot of different companies um, for, to install stuff for application. So the answer to the question is if the parent company goes under, well, if the stuff is GPL and it's released into a while, anybody can go out and continue to develop it. Um, if you take a look at Red Hat, for example, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, all that stuff is built at source. Um, there's a company called CentOS, C-N-T-O-S, which runs for Mentos. Um, they have produced the exact source level clone of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. You don't have to go out and pay. $800 a copy for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. You can go to CentOS.org, download their version of the Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5, which is called CentOS Enterprise Linux 5. It has the same exact source tree, same exact packages, completely package level and software level, um, identical and compatible. Only difference is that they changed the, uh, the, the artwork. Instead of a Red Hat, it's got a little CentOS logo on it. Other than that, it's identical. That's exactly what Oracle did when they built Oracle Enterprise Linux. They took CentOS. Well, they, they did a lot of that. Actually, I was talking to this, the developer over at CentOS, and they did a, a, a bit level uh, comparison of uh, Oracle Enterprise Linux and CentOS. And they discovered that they, in fact, did use files and stuff from CentOS. Um, so it, it appears that, that Oracle Enterprise Linux is a, not a Red Hat copy, but a CentOS copy. Um, because they use the same young uh, modifications and stuff that uh, CentOS uses to do its updates. Um, so what we've got here is the... Yep. Do they provide like updates as well? Who? Do they have like updates? Yes, they have updates, they do. Now they don't just... CentOS lasts about two or three days on my Yeah, that's it. About two or three weeks for a major update. Yeah, a major update, they, they do take longer, but I mean, it's free. <laughs> So um, what we have here is the, the GNOME version of the SUSE, of the SUSE Linux desktop, and as you can see, their favorite color is green. Um, I, don't, I don't know why I actually virtualized the floppy process because left and didn't have one. Um, so I was going to have to turn it off. And we don't have a floppy drive. Um, this is their version of the, the Nautilus browser. We've also got a little demon here running here in the corner uh, to check to see if there are any updates. Okay, we're up to date. Nice enough. 
um, you've got their version of Now what they've got here, you can see, they've sort of built, um, this is Gnome, but what they have built is sort of, a, I think it's called the SLED, I forget what the extension is called, but they, they modified the Gnome desktop so that it, it sort of uh, behaves more like Windows. Um, they did this as a part of a, a usability um, UI uh, study that they did, I think in 2005 or six, and then they, they basically threw a whole bunch of users at things. They said, no, we don't like this, we want to change. And they basically modified and built a, a, a UI basically to be more user-friendly. So they've kind of got like a similar Windows paradigm. You know, you've got documents in places, your applications, um, Banshee is a cool uh, music player application that's developed uh, by Novell. It basically looks like iTunes. Um, hopefully it won't blow up if I try to load it. Because this is, like I said, at least candidate level. So this just wants to know where my music library is. If I had an iPod, I could just connect it with a USB and it would import all my stuff. Yeah, this is their control center. So this is what we used to call YASP. Um, you can actually filter, um, you can actually end up with a lot of stuff in here. His desktop effects. Um, if I actually had a card that would support it, I could just click on this and get it to do something. Um, so I'll imagine this kind of interesting the way it works. Uh, here you go. Yeah, yeah I mean, with graphics card, it's not going to work. Systems, the control center, which I need application. More application. A lot more stuff in here. A lot more stuff in here. Did I say there was a lot of stuff in here? There was a lot of stuff in here. Um, let me show you the software. Yeah. I like this open. Actually, now it's going into the uh, the cache of the uh, file repository, the software repository. It's got updating uh, descriptions from over the internet. Um, this is their uh, their software manifest browser. There's a lot of stuff in there. Something that we could actually want to install. Look at the word name. <laughs> Ooh, Ed Palmer. Thank you. 
I think I did like a full blown install on this. There's probably nothing left to install. I'll install everything when I did install. Do you want to check if Matt Bomber is in Bomber? Yeah. Using the I mean, you got all the stuff, packages, all the server packages, and all It's all there.
Yeah. You know, my open, my Susie 10.1 actually found my uh, IBM wireless network, but uh, the uh, Ubuntu didn't. You mean on a, on a ThinkPad? Yeah. I'm pretty sure there are ThinkPad drivers for it. On Ubuntu? Well, yeah, actually. It's, uh, it uses the same man white clock stuff. Um, that's in Ralph Bottom, I know it does work. What would you say would be the open, uh, the minimum resources to run open source? Hardware <coughs> resources. A minimum for what? Okay, well, for example, I've had great success running X Ubuntu right. in older hardware, right. recycling older hardware. Uh, I, I could say I had a very satisfactory machine yeah. in a 300 megahertz 256 sure. megahertz RAM, which I brought to GoogleCon. <coughs> And was running four desktops quite successfully uh, with X. Now, what would be my what would I look at as my minimum uh, resource uh, window for OpenSUSE? OpenSUSE, I'm going to say you need a gig of RAM. Okay. I'm actually running this in a 512 minute virtual machine, but I didn't get hacking performance. I'm going to say it did. Um, but you're going to want to turn off like their uh, people. Uh, desktop search, you know, database and stuff. I mean, you'll still have to do the tweaking of your services, turning the few things on and off, but it's it decent performance on the data RAM. Yeah. So for the older machines, you know, I want to stick to the X. Yep. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so there are some things Linux that works like uh, Windows System Restore. Yeah. A system restore, you mean like, like an image or something? It's a snapshot of the system and then yeah. which can be restored to when the system is pulled up, basically. So, so desktop running. I don't know of anything of that built into the Linux distribution. What I can recommend it to do, and what I do with a lot of my systems is um, I use something called the System Restore CD, which is actually the bootable Linux uh, distribution. Um, and what it has on it is image backup based software. So it's basically a different boot with a with a with the C D and you can take any basically boots into a GUI and it's got a program that allows you to uh, it's, it's called um sysimage or something like that. It's, it's I wrote an actually an article on it. If you go to um to Linux Magazine if you system rescue C D, you search on that. I wrote a whole article about how you can back up uh, with that that C D to a, a USB hard drive or a secondary hard drive to do partition copies of your OS. So if you blow it, you can just do a system restore. It's completely free software. Does it compress? Yes. System restore CD. System rescue CD, I'm sorry. Um, I do restore. Um, just they don't have a new version coming out anytime soon. When? Really? Why, don't I show Why am I not using Fedora? Fedora is a good distribution. Um, I, I actually prefer the enterprise level of Red Hat. I actually use on my actually I'm running RHEL 5 now on my on my on my laptop. Um, I just prefer the, the uh, I find that Fedora in terms of stability um, isn't as good as OpenSUSE in terms of the, the the release level of you know, stability on the actual product. I find that itself just tends to blow up a lot more often. I also don't like um, I don't like uh, the way that it seems to be sort of a moving target like every other week. They, they actually release so many packages that you don't know what you're going to get into the one. So I think like on any given day, if you do a young update, you can completely in a state of life. That's at least what I found with the door. Now there's some people who love the door. Um, a lot of people who develop for Red Hat stuff use Fedora's developed platform. I like I like either CentOS or or Rel5. <laughs> um, yeah. Right.
you, most of the new Linux distributions are pretty friendly when it comes to installing on top of Windows. But the key is, you got to have enough space. Um, I don't particularly like the ones that resize NTFS partitions. I find that the um, sometimes when you resize stuff, get and then you install a new partition next to it, works for a couple months real good, and suddenly your NTFS metadata starts going bad. Start getting check disk errors when you put it into Windows. So what I like to do is either buy yourself a fresh new hard drive, go, go to go to Circuit City or Amazon, buy yourself a you know, 100, 200 gig hard drive for a home, 50 bucks or 80 bucks, whatever it is. Install your secondary hard drive, um, and then all you're going to do is when you install Linux, you're going to install the bootloader onto your first partition, which does not impact Windows at all. Um, and then and then you just use a completely separate hard drive to boot your Linux stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean you can. I'm just saying it's a lot safer to have a separate room way to help hard drives there just get another hard drive just run Linux. Well VMware is completely virtualized. You're 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 using a level of hardware software emulation to boot a virtual, you know, machine. There's literally, I mean, VMware, the operating system running VMware literally thinks it's running on hardware. Um, now, you are going to have performance issues uh, doing that. I mean, we are running a little bit slower um, than we would immediately. Um, I mean, actually, if I had enough RAM in the system, it would run great. There's only two gig machines, so if I had four or eight gigs of RAM in the box, I could run the open system really fast because I could house with enough memory that it would use normally in a real box. But since I'm you know, limited by resources here, I can only get 512 megs without chunking and slowing my system down. Now, so VMware is an excellent system for one, having, if you only have a few Windows applications that you need to run, um, it's a good way to segregate Windows from your Linux so that you don't have any possible cross contamination issues with, you know, viruses and whatnot. And it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's a good way to back up your Windows going to be stored into a file, you can just, you know, write the files to your backup device and in case your Windows goes out, you just restore it and get the Windows again. So in terms of um, disaster recovery, um, VMware is an excellent option. You're going to be seeing in enterprise environments over the next four or five years, basically all your servers are going to end up being virtualized. This would be so much easier just to snapshot your disk and something goes wrong, bam, snap it back and you get your systems. And you can also provision servers much faster than you just basically just take a snap copy of what you just had and you copy one Linux box to another one and then you've got another application server in five seconds. So the future is going to be virtualization. The question is, how quickly can we get virtualization acceleration into the systems, the PCs and the servers themselves to compensate for the uh, for the, the overhead and, and what we call the hypervisors, which is what is used just used underneath the operating system. Right, to load the virtual machine. So that's that's sort of the future of computing. Yes. Do you know any institution which has which has a little bit of unified control over TV out? TV out. Okay. So you want like a multimedia distribution for television type stuff? Okay. So there are distributions out there that will allow you specifically to do DVR, you know, uh, multimedia type stuff. One of those is Myth, uh, Myth TV, and I think there's um, Not Myth, K N O P P M Y D H, which is a version of Debian that installs in the box. It has all the multimedia TiVo type stuff put into it. There's at least three or four other different flavors of different types of stuff that would do that. I just don't know what they are on the top of my head. Yep. I just found out about another one a couple of days ago called Linux Media NCE. Okay. Oh, is it, is it MCE or NCE? Someone said something about NCE. MCE Linux. Okay, there you go. That's your answer. Videos and so on. Examples. Cool. And it has like integrated, uh, like an asterisk system. It's got the PBX stuff and all that. Yeah, it also, also integrates pretty automatically with um, home security software and some of the things that control lights. It's really a full house control. Cool. Yes. When, when would you compare open source with Ubuntu in terms of two factors? One, reliability, particularly when it comes to the very demanding, let's say, academic research, and two, uh, 
when the easiness is used for users not so familiar with Linux, meaning so students or right. workers with Windows. Which one would you prefer or maybe something else? Um, I like, I actually use the mind both systems for different purposes. Um, SUSE follows, even though it's an open source product, it follows a more traditional uh, developer model. Um, it's still, most of the development is still done by a lot of those German guys in Nuremberg, although there is a lot of collaboration coming in from the community. Um, Ubuntu is a completely distributed development model for people all over the world. Um, so. It's, it's hard to talk about which is more reliable or more mission, you know, more mission critical worthy. Um, I know a lot of people uh, where Sun really like Ubuntu um, for uh, they have the N1 uh, processor version that run on Spark hardware and they say it's really nice. Um, and um, for end users, I think at this point they're kind of approaching parity in terms of their features. I think um, OpenSUSE has more software in it by default. So the, the user doesn't have to go looking for stuff for packages to install. Um, but I think they're both about the same in terms of usability at this point. Um, and I like OpenSUSE for its usability as well. Uh, Mailin is a yes. And I'm a Red Hat guy to do that. But yes is truly excellent. Yeah, yes is really the Mercedes Benz of the uh, configuration. Yeah. I, I have an IBM T60. I have the same laptop I got. And the CD burden. Yep. What is the CD burden for SUSE? I don't know. I'm about to find that out. I'm about to probably install it on my laptop this weekend. Now, if you like right click on the ISO novels, you can import the CD option. So, pretty cool. Yeah. And the answer is like CD. Yeah, there are two actually really good burner applications. One is called Rosero, B-R-A-S-E-R-O, um, which is a GNOME one, which is very good, and the other one is K3B, um, which looks just like <coughs> a Linux version of Nero. Um, it does basically, you know, it cleans your house screen. It does, it does everything. You can master audio and video and all that kind of stuff. I use it all the time. Um, and I think, you know, I think, depending on what distribution you're using, you either got to add it as a, as, as a uh, from your, your software repository, or um, or you or may even be built in depending on, on, on how you install. It. So, yeah. Um, Python and Ruby works on Python and Ruby works on pretty much all distributions. In fact, it's usually. Um, Pretty much a default install on, on, on a lot of them now because people are building applications for these distributions. It's part of the main distribution um, with those subsystems. So I would say pretty much any modern money distribution is going to have support for those. Red Hat is required. Yeah. I think it's utilities are actually built in high down. How high do you use for the interface? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. What's the name of the UK company that makes the social? In the I want here. Okay. You know what I noticed too with the uh, uh, open source? Uh, it doesn't use CSS. Uh, in the browser? You sure? Sure. Because when you increase the uh, font size, the text size, it kind of runs into each other. Where yeah, that works. Okay. Thank you. And I think you can actually order developer versions of their, of their hardware at this point. And I'm left with the box, like five hundred thousand dollars for developers. Except for the hardware development. Hmm? Excuse me? Right. Exactly. So, any more questions? We're kind of running uh, towards the end here. Okay. Well, I, uh, I really appreciate you guys having me today, and hopefully, um, I got to show you some interesting stuff and answer some good questions. And uh, I look forward to coming back some other time. Thank you.